So I do want to talk more about the markets, um, and I want to bring in our next guest, Ryan Payne. He's the president of Payne Capital Management. Uh, Ryan, how fitting that you're joining today, because I know you've been watching this tech sector very closely and did warn just about a month ago that it was looking a little bit frothy. What do you think today? Um, yeah, we're definitely getting a healthy rebound there. We're still not back to the highs, I guess I called a couple weeks back, but I don't think the trend's over, Kristen. You know, I do think tech is completely overvalued here, but you know, as the old saying goes, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So, I mean, clearly money's getting rotated back into tech here. We're seeing a big move up in tech, but as a long-term investor, I urge you to diversify here. And if you look at the last couple weeks in the market, we have seen some rotation. You know, we're starting to see other asset classes move. Like last week, small caps were up over 6%. Uh, if you look at the emerging markets, they're now positive for the year. So I think it's still a great time to diversify your money. Tech trend's probably not over, but, you know, I'll just emphasize this, it's still overvalued from where I'm standing. Okay, so where are you putting your money to work right now? Um, you know, just talking about a couple of these asset classes I just spoke about. So I think emerging markets here look great. Are there any uh, again, individual they are positive. stocks, Ryan, or just, just particular sectors that you're focused on? Well, we're an asset allocator at my firm, but if you want to get into the granular, I, mean, I do like energy here. I think you could buy uh, the, the larger integrated oil companies like Chevron, Exxon here. That's probably the most grossly out of favor part of the market, down you know close to 50% for the year. But when you start looking at supply and demand and you start looking at U.S. supplies being down the last nine of the last 11 weeks, and global demand should continue to go up over the next couple of years, I think it's a great place to deploy some capital, mm. not to mention the dividends you're going to earn there versus, mm. you know, the tech sector does not pay great dividends here, Kristen. So I think that's another thing you want to look at is getting paid to be in some of these other asset classes. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the broad market then, just in terms of how uh, people's uh, ETFs, mutual funds might be moving based on some of these headlines. Still a stimulus stalemate in Washington. And then the J&J &J news this morning. I don't know how focused you are on this vaccine news, Ryan, but now only two of the four uh, potential vaccine makers are still actively in these late stage trials. And I think that could potentially be a concern for this economy, getting back to some sense of normalcy, if we will. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's going to be fits and starts in regards to what happens with the vaccine. So I don't think anyone's expecting that anytime soon. I mean, realistically, even if we were to get one vaccine out of the four, to your point, that are in trials right now, I mean, when are people realistically going to start taking that? I mean, it could be as late as next spring or next summer. So I think the other thing is just that contact tracing is a big, big deal. And the more we increase that, the more we're able to isolate a lot of these incidents that flare up. So I'm optimistic. I think, you know, any sort of second wave we've been hearing about, you know, the market obviously knows that already. We're talking about it. It's not a secret. So you know, I just wonder with the social distancing measures in place and again, better contract contact tracing as we move along. Um, I think those that's still going to improve in terms of getting back to normalcy, mm -hmm. even if we don't have the vaccine uh, as soon as some may expect. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more the long game here, Kristen. Uh, Biden, uh, Biden widening his lead in the polls, Ryan. It looks like it's giving investors a little bit more certainty this past week or so since Trump's COVID diagnosis that we might have a better idea of who the winner is on election night. Uh, of course, there's still questions about a contested election and still in the next three weeks, obviously a lot could change. But how are you looking at that? Does that change your asset allocation at all? Where you're putting money to work, knowing that at least for now, uh, Biden has widened his lead in these polls? Yeah, well, we know how good those polls are, um, and I realize he has a little bit bigger lead than uh, Clinton did over Trump back in 2016. You can go back to Reagan in 1980. He actually had an eight-point uh, deficit versus Carter, and he won that election. So I'm not putting too much faith in the polls here, but speaking completely politically agnostic right now, you know, regardless of who gets into office, and I know right now it feels like if your party doesn't win, your party doesn't get in, that could have a detrimental detrimental effect on the market. I would argue against that with the trillions of dollars that are being printed right now globally. And I have to think no matter who gets into power here, Kristen, the printing press is going to continue to print and the V-shaped recovery we've seen already in the economy. I mean, we really had a two-month recession. And if you look at the numbers, you know, within the economy right now, unemployment has come down a lot over the last couple of months. You start looking at GDP growth this month or this quarter, next quarter, that's going to come in phenomenally well. 
And you start looking at earnings next year, that could be as high as like a 20 25% increase over this year. These are bigger, more powerful trends. It's just so hard for me not to be overall bullish. And you know I like to be a bull, uh, you know, given the fact there's these other powerful forces at work. So I would ignore the election noise and I'd get invested right now. Interesting. Um, okay. And, and even though you think tech is overvalued, you would be putting money to work in the S&P 500 and the Dow. I mean, I know you have certain asset uh, allocations like energy, for instance, that you're more focused on. But broadly speaking, you would be buying stocks. Yeah, I think you want to own everything. Be careful with the S&P 500. You know, I've talked about this a lot. It's a tech fun and drag. I mean, literally, you have five stocks that make up 25 percent of that that are all tech related. So it's not real diversification, right? I call it the S&P 5 versus the S&P 500. So I think the smartest move you can make as an investor right now is to start to spread your capital out. Yes, have some money in growth, have some money in tech, but don't overweight it. It is overvalued. And my thoughts are, I've said this a lot, when the music stops, it's not going to be pretty, Kristen. So I think it's a smart move right now to start to diversify buying value stocks. We talk about energy, looking at financials. Um, you look at those loan loss provisions at JP Morgan, they actually reduced them a little bit because they were so conservative early on. And I think that's what most companies are doing right now. They're managing their balance sheet so, so well. So as the economy reopens, you know, they can do less revenue and have even better earnings just because they're much leaner and meaner than they were before going into the pandemic. Ryan, Ryan, so diversification quickly, here is key. Ryan, let me, so just, we only have a little bit of time left. I want you to break down a, a financial sector investment for our viewers because we do anticipate that rates are gonna stay low for the foreseeable future, near zero, uh, likely for years to come because of the crisis that we're in. How does that affect an investment in some of these financial stocks? Well, I think you have to be careful there because the 10-year treasury has moved up quite a bit over the course of the last couple of weeks. But you have to remember, the Fed can control short-term rates, but the bond gods, we like to say, uh, drive uh, long-term interest rates. So if the economy starts to remobilize like it is and the global economy keeps moving up and global interest rates start to move up, there's no reason interest rates can't move up in the U.S. too. And you have to remember, the Fed can't control what longer rates do. And if longer rates start to go up, that's very, very good for the banks. It's very good for their net interest margins. And I suspect right now, the world is priced to rates won't go up. So any sort of interest rate rise will be a big surprise in the positive for the banks. Very good for the balance sheets. And I think that's a really good reason why I would own banks here, not to mention the dividends as well. Okay, not tech and drag, <laughs> which is what you described not tech as and the S&P exactly. 500. Thank you. All right, Ryan Payne, it's good to see you. He's the president of Payne Capital Management.